Let's start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us in our conversation. Um, help us through the insights of St. Catherine of Siena and the, the gifts that the Lord gave to her, that we might be drawn um, ever closer to your Son, who is the bridge um, to eternal life. We ask this as we ask all things through Christ, our Lord, our bridge. Amen. 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 Okay, so let's uh, dive back in to the 50... 55. 55. Okay, yes, 56. All right. 56. 55 is very short. So every, is everybody at 56? Okay, so I, I, I read ahead I did this a whole two months ago. If I remember that long. Okay, so she's she's summing up and she's saying that I've shown you how to walk. Okay, this is how you to walk is to live. This is how you are to live your your relationship with God. And she set it up with how we are to see that we we all really kind of start in the river, right? And that we have to get out of the river. And how do we get out of the river? The three steps, right? And uh, and what are the three steps? Memory, right? Understanding, understanding and will. They nailed it. And what she, she refers, she refers to the three steps really as reason, using our reason. So this is com, uh, completely our natural powers. Right? So that's how we get out of the river. Um, and then we have to use all three of these we have to use all three of these steps and you can't have one step without the other, okay? Remember how last we were talking about which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? So so it's it's not um, linear, linear, it's more kind of like um, maybe a circle, right? And so we can kind of, um, we don't necessarily even, maybe even begin with memory uh, because she says there, there can't be anything in the memory in, in, unless it's the will's first been touched. Um, so, and what does the memory do? The memory holds on, right? And so, ju just the fact that you're, you're here and you're thinking about these things, you're holding on to information, facts, knowledge, with what? Your memory. That's your memory. Because a lot of times we think about memory is remembering something clear in the past. No, memory is like what you're holding in your, in your mind right now, right? And then I have the power to think about what's in my mind, consider what's in my mind. Are you with me here? Okay. Um, so they're, they're distinct. And the way that we use the word memory is, um, is really just events that, that are, have been stored in the closet, right? And they're somewhere back there that, and then we can maybe bring them back out when we want to. So no, like that's why you know you talk about dementia, um, um, and uh, the problem with that is like that, that a, a person who is suffering severely from dementia, right? Alzheimer's. My grandpa had Alzheimer's. Um, the last years of his life is like they can't carry out any kind of conversation because they can't hold anything in their memory, right? In their mind right now. Um, although interestingly, sometimes they they can recall things from the past or prayers they memorized, right? So, okay, so, so she's, she is, she's saying that, okay, we got, we have to be really intense about this as far as like, um, maybe you might even say what's on your mind. What's on your mind is really memory. So that means that uh, if you're the evil spirit and you want to keep people in the river of finding, basically living your life, um, directed towards all of the pleasures of, of the world, right? And especially the more sensual pleasures um, around um, physical pleasure and possessions. So if you're the evil spirit and uh, you're wanting to keep people in the water, what would you do? 
What would you do? I don't want to talk. Okay. What would you do? Just keep throwing those things at them. Yeah. Keep keep. Uh, you want you want to like keep feeding their mind. So it's like, okay. So this is not to say it's like um, we're condemning um, you know modern communication, but like look look at the way the modern communication is happening, especially like social media. So I look at social media um, um, several times a day, but I also know my dad, who's 79 years old, um, you, he'll just go scrolling through Facebook forever, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, who would have thought he can hardly, you know, even he can't even, he can't type or anything. But like, um, so what what does that what does that do? That what's the problem here? Is it keeps those things on your mind, right? And then it's those things that you're you're thinking about. And then guess what? When we get together, those are the things we're talking about, right? And getting impassioned about. So, of course, virtue is in the middle. So I'm just taking the kind of extreme examples, but I'm I want to highlight is like the, the most, one of the most biggest things that the evil spirit can do is just keep us preoccupied with the banal, right? Of with just the um, ordinary and superficial. Um, um, pleasures of the world the uh, um, and Cicero said that basically to to um, control the masses you just have to have circuses I mean entertainment and sports and pan bread food and sports kind of <laughs> right and you think about like the amount of money and like the energy in it like it's the problem isn't the sports okay that's not it, the problem is it's like now it's all consuming like if you want to be a part of, you're a fifth grader and you want to be on a team like you're like a you're traveling on sundays sometimes i mean for fifth graders right it's like what and so what does that mean it's like oh i'm not i'm not rejecting god no you're not deliberately rejecting god you're not making a choice i choose to reject him but that's not that that's not the only way that we lose our our this vital bond with God. This is what the catechism says. It's not the, just by like, I, re, I, have, I want to have nothing to do with God. That's not what these people are saying. That would, that would lead you to re, lose your bond with God, right? The catechism says there's two other ways that the vital bond can be lost by being forgotten. <laughs> and, or overlooked <clears throat> I think there's there's a big difference in here as far as forgotten um, someone got upset with me I mean, every day okay. <laughs> um, someone got upset with me uh, a few weeks ago because I was making a distinction between Protestant theology and Catholic theology and why bring those divisions in because it, those, those are not true they're not true that's not accurate you're not understanding right um, in my mind, I'm like, hello. Um, like, no, there are distinctions. And maybe I didn't, that wasn't, um, because maybe it wasn't a good forum and the, and I wasn't meet, meet, meeting people where they're at. But we're so distant from the Protestant <coughs> Reformation and all the things that have happened in the 20th century, no one even remembers what the distinctions between Protestant theology and Catholic theology are, right? So it's been completely forgotten. Overlooked would be what? I would call that distracted or uh, what were you gonna say neglect neglect right leads you to to being distract distracted so according to the catechism it says that the vital bond can be lost um if that is true okay then it's not just me willing to reject god that lead that can lead me to hell it's actually forgetting or overlooking oh there's no precedent of that in the old testament no it's constant when the people would go into exile like Babylonia, the Babylonian exile, it's because they had forgotten the wonderful, they soon forgot the wonderful works of the Lord. This is kind of like, but it makes completely sense if we're saved by love, love is always, if you love, then whatever you love, that's what you're thinking about. I mean that, if, if you don't think about something very often, you love it very little. And in the end will be judged according to St. John of the Cross. This is quoted in the Catechism too. By what? Love. Love of God. Right? 
Okay, so um, just kind of getting back to here, and we're talking about our, this is how reason gets out of the swamp. And the reason that we stay out in the swamp, according to her, is because of our selfish self-love. That's an important term. Selfish self-love. What is she making a distinction here? Is she making a distinction? Selfish yeah. self-love. Yeah, what is it, Angela? Well, we need self-love. Yeah. Right? But selfish self-love is to think only of ourselves. Yeah. It's immoderate, it's excessive. Yeah. Um, it's inordinate. It's not ordered right. Like, and so love your neighbor as your self. Yeah. So there, and so some people, so this is a vice too, of like, if I don't have true self-love, but selfish self-love, selfish self-love. And, and so basically that selfish self-love then is what, where my memory, understanding and will live. What's in it for me, right? What am I going to get out of this? And your good's not even um, on my mind, so it's not in my memory. But if I'm relating to you, it's because I want something. Oh, Father's calling. He wants <laughs> not far from the truth. Okay, so. Okay, everybody's clear here? Um, and, and remember, like she, she says, you've got, we've got to work at, at, at digging this out, digging out this selfish self-love. She talks about using a knife. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll get that into it in, in a different way. But this is, this selfish self-love um, has not, was not created or cultivated by us. I mean, yeah, it was, yeah, it was not acquired by our work. It was built up by choices we've made and we become more selfish, right? If you give a little, um, we talk about um, with little kids, you keep giving them everything they want. What happens? They turn into a tyrant. I mean, really, right? Because they don't have the use of reason. So they're, you, the parents are cultivating this in them. Um, and so, so it can be cultivated, selfishness can be cultivated, but original sin, original sin is, is basically a habit of the heart inclining us to be selfish. That's one way to say it on a real practical level. So anybody who says that they're not selfish um, is either a liar or um, lacks incredible self-awareness, I would say. Because the most, the holiest people that I know actually, um, who I would say that I don't see any selfishness in, they have an incredible sensitivity to like, oh no, I'm, I've got a long ways to go. It's kind of like the perfect, like, um, you know, professional athletes. They, they, if there's just, just a, one iota of something that's off, I mean, like it's glaring for them, right? So, okay. So she says, um, now I'm gonna show you, we're on, on paragraph 56, one, about five lines down. I will show you these in three stages. Okay, so she, she we're, we're climbing out the stairway and now we're going on the road by, by living. And so that there is three degrees or stages of the soul and the three stairs. So there's three stairs, three stages. Are they the same? Are the stages and the stairs are the same? No, they're not. Remember, these are the stairs. These are the stairs. The stages, let's go to them. And this really, she's using a little bit different wording, but, but really she's talking ultimately about the three stages of the spiritual life. The purgative, the illuminative, the unitive, um, and beginners, proficients, perfect, right? So like, I don't know what they do with like swimming lessons anymore. Um, but when I was going through that, you had beginners, advanced beginners, intermediate, um, and then lifesavers. Lifesavers, yeah, or something, yeah, like that. I quit when I was advanced beginners. I talked about my dad had to. <laughs> <laughs> I was already perfect in my head. Okay. <laughs> I, I hated swimming. So, okay. Um, 
So that's what we say in the spiritual life. And this is what she's saying here. Okay. Um, the first of these stages, the imperfect, then the more perfect, then the most perfect. Okay, the imperfect, the perfect, and the most perfect. Okay, so um, what if... These individuals. And most perfect. And all of these three have to do with the degree where you are, no, where you're rolling, you might say, where your flow is in your relationship with God. Okay? Um, it doesn't mean that, at, there's, she says in here, it's not, there may be areas of your life where you're most perfect <laughs> and areas where you're imperfect. She says that all three of them can exist in the same soul at the same time. That's helpful because a lot of times um, when you read like St. Teresa of Avila or St. John on the Cross and they have to see the interior castle, you have all of these going into all of these rooms or these mansions. So which room am I in? Okay, well, I'm not in that room anymore. Or St. John of the Cross, the th you know, the three ways, the purgative, the illuminative, the unitive, which, which stage am I in? Okay, so all of this applies to me and none of this applies to me. Well, no, she's saying that all three of them can exist. So there's... Um, and one area of my life, um, I'm a mess, right? And another area of my life, maybe it's just, maybe it's just um, the life of prayer in itself that there's a high level of, of virtue, of perfection. Okay, so, so she says that explicitly. Um, in there are three stages for which many have the capacity. These are their stages. And all three can be present in one and the same person. All three can be present in one in the same person. Okay. Um, here she gives, um, when she's talking about talking about these, the imperfect, the perfect, and the most imperfect, who, what does she compare the first one to? Mercenary. Mercenary. Okay. The second is? Faithful servant. Faithful servant. Servant, right? The third is what? Child. Child, right? Uh, child. Familial. Mm -hmm. Right? You're a family member, right? And so the, the stages of the spiritual these are the stages of the spiritual life the stages of the spiritual life are determined by the behaviors the actions that are characteristic the proper to each stage so it's determined by the types of behaviors that are proper to each stage so that means basically what type of behavior if you're in this stage what type of behaviors are you performing um, what what's the focus of your activities? What motivate what motivates you? So, uh, what motivates a mercenary? Money. What's that? Money. Money, right? Um, does he even care? Does that person even care about the cause? Now, not only to the degree that he. They could be on either side. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so, do we actually start off like that in our spiritual lives? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we, nobody starts off perfect. Nobody starts off. So, like, um, and it's not until the end of the gospel, John 15, 15, that Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, but friends or family. Um, so, we start off as mercenary, and there's parts of our spiritual life that are mercenary right now. Um, and so what, is, what does that mean then if there's a part of your, your spiritual life that's mercenary? You do it for what you're getting out of it. Purely, yeah. right? Yeah. Pretty much purely. Mm -hmm. and, and so sometimes I like to look at this 
Um, I call it the stages of stewardship. Um, and it's most, it's probably best reflected in stewardship as it relates to the school, but we have people that um, are at the mercenary stage where basically it's like, they, they really have no, I mean, they don't, if, if it happens, it's okay. If they win, they lose, whatever. I mean, like, that'd be nice. As long as it doesn't affect what I want here. And I want my kids in this wonderful Catholic school, right? So I'm gonna practice stewardship at the level, only at the level that's absolutely required, right? And, and so I'm gonna do this to get my money, my goods, my cattle, <laughs> in a certain sense, right? And, and so that gets people, that helps to get people in the door to start practicing some good habits. Um, there's a stage before, unfortunately, and this is what we're dealing with here, is that people who are um, not at the, per like say, if we set, talk about stewardship stages, people who are not even at the, at the imperfect and are, that are, they're kind of like those, <laughs> um, the, the wedding guests, they were not properly clothed, <laughs> you might say. Um, so they, they get their kids um, into the school, right? All right, they get they get they get what they want, but they're not uh, practicing doing anything in regards to living their stewardship. They're just sneaking around like a thief. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Those people do not like me. They're liking me less. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, these individuals, and it's never their fault. I'm not being sensitive about this one. <laughs> uh, there was one thing I was going to say about this. Um, this stage. Oh, it would come to me. So anyway, um, the goal, like with stages, is to move one people from one stage to the next, right? If you're talking about work evangelization and working with other people, that means like you can't tr tr treat the mercenary like a servant because it won't mo motivate them. What motivates a servant? Love. Respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. A good servant. Kindness. Kindness would be a characteristic ask. Well, the desire to please the master. Good, please the master. A good cause you see that it's beneficial, like what? something I want to be a part of. Yeah. So, like, a good servant, it, would you see that as a positive thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, yeah. As a, so, the, is the good servant, like, if he, he has a servant's heart, she has a servant's heart, what, is, what does that mean? He's trying to please. What? He loves him. He loves him, right? Mm -hmm. And so, is the mercenary, can, so like, if I'm talking about a person at, the, at this stage, um, do they really, are they, what's in their memory, what they're thinking about, what they're occupied with, is it the money? Is it the booty? No. Right? And so this makes sense, doesn't it? It's like, um, if you don't know where you're at here, you can't motivate other people or yourself towards advancing and growing. <clears throat> um, so it's like with the mercenary, like what's in it, if I start off, what's in it for me? This is why like in a, in a certain way, stewardship can be so powerful because it can bring, bring people um, along in their relationship with God because you're practicing behaviors that pertain to living in relationship with God. And, and so the goal is like, um, after practicing in a while, I experience the freedom. Remember the second stage is the free. <laughs> I experience it like my life is better in a, in a sense of like, I, I am, I'm enjoying this. And they begin to be concerned less about what they're getting. They just, this is a good way of life. That's what we call it the stewardship way of life, right? And and so, okay, so we get to this point, um, and you can we can think that we've arrived, but we haven't arrived, because most perfect is is out of what? 
love, love, love and what kind of love? It's filial love, so that would be love of God. Yeah. So we're talking about what you're preoccupied with is what pleases God. That doesn't mean that, okay, I don't really care about serving you. I just know I want to serve you. I don't love you, but I, I know that it pleases God, so. No, because the natural and the supernatural are not in competition or conflict. This is the beautiful thing, so that that the natural and the supernatural can coexist. Um, so you, you can have, that means that at the natural level, at the human level, um, like life, what, the flourishing of natural life, French, say friendships, right? Or even talk about wealth. Um, none of those things in themselves are in competition with God, love of God. So it's like, oh, if I love God, then no, we can't be friends, or I can't have money, or um, so anything that's, that would build up and lead to human flourishing. I can't have meaningful work, can't do anything I enjoy, um, right? I can't have any pleasure, no? So God made all of those things, right? And so the what we believe and what we say is that they they only are problematic when they are contrary to our ultimate happiness, our ultimate good of happiness in God. That means we're making these things our gods. They become remember last week we were talking about our idols. We become attached and consumed. Like it's what this it's what preoccupies our time right, and our thoughts so if we're not thinking very much about god or living well living rightly so it's not magic you know like etern- spirit, spiritual life is not magic and in some other world like it's here right now that i can i can have a i can have a, a sense or maybe a rough estimate of where i am in my relationship with god am i striving Am I striving? Am I investing? Okay, that says, that's, that tells me where my heart is. And this, my dad's favorite, one of his favorite sayings was like, people do what they want to do. That's because, you, yeah. Everybody talks about money because it's often true like in prayer. Like for instance, I have no prayer life. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, I got an illness or something, I pray to the Lord, you know, give me, please heal me. That's kind of like the imperfect. Yeah. But then maybe the, perfect would be more okay i'm a little more committed i do my daily prayers you know and i know this is serving god yeah and then i can move to the next level which would be i'm doing it because i love god i want to be in union with him yeah i got the same spirit he does yeah so how do all of and then right and then like how do each of these individuals okay if these are these stages of the spiritual life are defined by the behaviors and the actions the activities that are proper to each stage uh, when this person experiences suffering in prayer, how does that work? <laughs> stop praying. Why? Why would they stop? Why would this group stop praying? Because they're not getting anything. They're not getting it. paid. There's no booty, <laughs> right? Well, that's what they used to call it. Okay. <laughs> we'll stop there. <laughs> right? And so, like. And uh, what's interesting is like a lot of times with evangelization, a, peer, a person who goes on a retreat, so Father Seth's on the Kairos retreats this weekend, right? So these kids are having um, some really profound experiences of God. Um, a number of them are. Um, think about our Acts retreats. Um, people have profound experiences of God, and so they're, they're lit up in the sense of like they're full and they never experienced spiritual delight before like this. The problem, and I think, I don't know, I mean, like, what we have to, what we're going to have to address is, like, the problem is, is, like, that doesn't make you into the perfect stage. You're, you're probably here. And you might advance further because you've been striving to live faithful for many years and you can move through. But, like, um, if I've, I'm experiencing this, del- this delight and a powerful encounter, I'm like Peter. I want to build, let's build some cabins here, right? Um and stay on this hill. No, the, the next place that they go is to the cross, the passion, right? Um, so basically, the purpose of the powerful consolation, um, amazing consolation, was to, to 
give them the energy and spirit that they need to trek the path. Um, so that's why I would say it's like, okay, like, and I, we've all, I'm, I mean, I would, I know I've, I've been at that for sure for many years, and there's still parts of my spiritual life where I'm at, at this stage. It's like, um, that, well, probably not too many at this stage, but like, but there's thoughts for sure of like, just, this isn't doing any good. Just will quit. That's mercenary mentality. There are parts of my heart that are not, not completely converted, right? And, and so now this one gets a bad rap often because this is where a good servant is what? Dutiful, right? And so I know, and I've, I've been the one that's kind of been poo-pooing this. Um, that's like duty-driven spiritual life, duty-driven stewardship. Um, and the reason I've done that is it's exaggeration for effect. I don't know if you never know us, I but exaggerate anything. Okay. But it's because we've been kind of living, if you spend too long just focusing on the duties, that becomes the entire reality. And after decades of this, I forgot what the whole purpose of it was. And it was a journey, right? Um, so that's why I would be talking about, but in itself, no, like the serpent is dutiful, right? And and actually, there's a lot of freedom and joy in if you're living duty in your relationship with God. You have God and the good here. You have it in perspective. It's not just you're preoccupied with what you have to do. Right? It's, that's, that's what the duty driven is. Um, but no, I, I like to think about the, just the, the spirit of the greatest generation when it came to our world wars and the, the energy and passion that they had for like fighting for their country, right? And God, family, country, right? And and so it's like they were happy and joyful about that. And they were, and so it's not just about what you're happy and joyful about. Okay, so there's natural satisfaction. It's also what you become sad about. If if some some of those guys that did were not accepted committed suicide because it was such, I mean, it's humiliating and like for themselves. Right. Um, <laughs> where where do you think we are now as a country? <laughs> here or back here? Right there. Back yeah. there. So now it's actually a vice. Um, if you're, you know, like um, even saying the word patriot, oh, your patriotism, that's like a bad word now, right? Um, okay, there might be some some, some issues around that. <laughs> like if we just take a, take a logical look into this. But it's the same thing in, in, uh, when we're talking about the spiritual life. I mean, like it's analogous to the spiritual life. Um, do you want to know what the, okay, the, what are the specific, practical, primary, specific, practical behaviors of those who are beginners or in the imperfect or who are mercenaries? Avoiding sin. And resisting sinful inclinations or concupiscences, desires, strong desires, inordinate desires. Avoiding, so this is the beginning of, this is really the beginning of the spiritual life. So if I come up on, on a retreat, <laughs> if I... If, if I actually understand the roadmap, you know, of how I'm going, my goal is going to be avoiding sin um, and resisting sinful in inclinations. Because I don't, because my habit, I like I had this powerful experience of God, but I'm not converted. I still have all of the habits I had before. Right? That's like the saying they told us in seminary. As a seminary and as a priest, you know, your ordination day is amazing, right? And so, like, I had all these bad habits in praying my liturgy hours. I'm giving an example, not like, <laughs> okay, um, right? And um, I'm not on time for anything. I'm still not on time for anything. Um, and I'm ordained, so wow. And you know, the whole community bows in veneration. And, and now I'm a priest, and so I'm perfect. I have, I'm perfect aligned in all of my commitments. No. <laughs> 
No, it's like, and what do we mean by sin? Sin literally yeah. means in the Old Testament missing the mark. So it's like I'm missing the mark in my relationship with the things of this world, right? I'm making too much or too little of these things, all, all of these different goods, right? Um, work is a good thing. So what would this example, missing the mark, is, would, would this be a sin? Um, that I live for work. Is that missing the mark? Yeah. It's missing the mark, right? Because it's not according to God's plan, right? Um, and so, and then what are sinful inclinations? So avoiding sin, that would be the actions, thought, word, and deed. But what's the sinful, resisting sinful inclinations? Temptations, right? Cravings for one thing or another. Um, so I have, um, so if I don't have the habit of making holy the Lord's day, um, then, and I have a powerful experience on a retreat, um, the, the glow and the afterglow, <laughs> the afterglow of the retreat is gone in a month. And what, um, so what am I going to be experiencing? And so that, that glow and that heat was what was um, projecting me. And that heat's, that heat's gone in a month. My cravings for not get, or for staying in bed and just doing nothing all day on Sunday. Okay, that's an inclin that's a inclination. That's a, that craving, that movement, it's strong. Are you with me here? Okay. So does that mean that these are the only activities? No, no that these are, these are, these are like the big rocks of, the, of this stage. Okay. What is the, in the second stage, which is the proficient, or she says what? More perfect. More, more perfect, or is it perfect? More perfect. More perfect. More perfect. More perfect. More perfect. Okay, so the primary behaviors, the big rocks. Okay, you have big rocks and little rocks and pebbles and sand, and you want to get it all into the jar. What are the big rocks of each stage? That doesn't mean that there's not other smaller rocks or other the other things that go into it. But like at this stage, growing in good habits um, is like almost like a. It's kind of the sand. It's like, you can't grow in good habits unless you've overcome bad habits. So for the more perfect, the activity, the primary activities, the behaviors, what, you're, what one is to be preoccupied with is actions pertaining to virtue. Thought, word, or deed. So like, okay. Um, I, I encourage everyone to kind of choose a virtue for the year. So I don't know if you did that. Um, so I chose meekness. So meekness falls under temperance, the cardinal virtue of temperance. And meekness has to do with um, um, the moderating of the, of the desire, the combative desire, the, um, the, uh, so, which is in all of us. And it's a good thing. We, we, we have to have that. It's where fortitude lives, right? And so to overcome difficulties, basically, to overcome difficulties, that, that spirit. Okay, so um, meekness, it moderates it because that spirit can be weak or too strong. Um, weak is that I don't really, I like cave for everything, right? And too strong is I want to fight everything, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so meekness moderates it, particularly in the too much aspect. Um, okay, so if I want to grow in, if I'm in this stage, I'm focusing on growing in the virtue of meekness. So, and so I'm, I'm practicing acts pertaining to meekness, to growing in that virtue, so that when it becomes a virtue, your the muscle in the soul, okay, um, the the desire that pertains that's natural to standing up to overcoming obstacles, um, you can, you're able to perform and execute 
in a way that's easy, joyful, and prompt in the right way. Like, that takes a lot, a lot of experiences and practices, but you can just like, you look forward to it, not to excessive in an excessive way, but to the right amount. <clears throat> so I would be thinking, in, that, in the practical level, I would maybe think about situations that, um, um, that lead to quick impulses towards like being combative, right? And so me, this would be okay. Um, I'm going to resist that impulse, right? I can use my reason to do that. Does it feel pleasant? No, right? And do I want to do it? No, because I don't have virtue. I don't have the virtue yet, but I'm performing actions that pertain to virtue. Does that mean that this? They don't. This group, when you're in this area, you don't worry about um, sin anymore. No, there's two actions, two activities, two big rocks for those who are in the perfect stage. Actions, activities pertaining to virtue, growing in virtue, and guarding from sin. Um, so this is different than avoiding sin. Um, uh, this, avoiding sin is is um, is like you're more in the in the stream of like sinning, and like this is your practice, right? Overeating is my practice. <laughs> Okay, I've got to avoid that. Now once it's, now once the kind of the war is over, I still have to leave troops to guard, okay, to ensure because things could go back to the way they were. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And remember, so, and I think it's good, we just start off with clear, like black and white distinctions between the, the stages. Then once we kind of grasp that, then we can kind of go into the nuances of, well, I can, there's part areas of my life where I'm here and where I'm here, okay? Now the most perfect stage. All of these are the stages, are stages of the virtue of charity, love of God, where you are at in, in your relationship and love of God. So the first thing that you have to have is what, that you, not to perform actions that are contrary to that are not loving. Okay, that's the first stage. Then I perform actions that are like directed in the are in the right direction, building good habits through lots of practice over a long period of time, through with lots of effort. And now, like this becomes kind of a way of life. But that and that's what my and and that has to do with what willing what doing and willing what God want, wills and does. Are you with me here? Okay, so. That's not the perfect stage, though. The perfect stage is most perfect, right? The most perfect stage is um, actions or behaviors directed to dwelling with God. And experiencing fruition or enjoyment in him. I notice this with a lot of like older couples who have had good marriages, 50 years, um, and uh, they're just with each other all, all the time. Like that is their inclination. It's like it's almost like their identity. They want to dwell together. Um, I, th I think about my um, my grandmother and grandfather after 50 years of marriage and like um, uh, often in the evenings just seeing them s sitting on the swing um, just sitting together all their meals together like they just want to dwell together dwelling is a home that, their home is not their home their home is the relationship right and um, so it's not just dwelling together but like um, they experience enjoyment, their fruition, the light um, in dwelling together. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so they don't, so I can remember with my grandparents of like um, being with them and we would go to the fair or, you know, it's like they didn't really talk too much back and forth, but like um, they were happy <laughs> where they were at dwelling with each other. 
So this is and so th this is what friendship does too, isn't it? Like, um, just like even even like middle schoolers or high schoolers, they want to spend time with their friends. They tell their parents, right? And what are you guys gonna do? Mm, they don't really have a clue. They just want to <laughs> hang out, right? Dwell it's, and they and they enjoy that, right? Um, so that's at the natural level, the happy the. <laughs> The greatest of natural happiness is friendship, natural friendship. Um, at the supernatural level, when it talks about charity, which is love of God, so love of other, another person, that's friend, that's natural friendship. Divine friendship is love of God. And, and what, what is it, what's the inclinations of this person? So in the beginning stages, the inclination is what? It's like, um, I'm trying to overcome my cravings, right? Now the craving is just to be with God. And I'm upset because I had so many duties and responsibilities, which I know God wanted me to do, that I I didn't get to spend time with God in prayer. Not because it was I failed as a it was a servant, but because I didn't get my duty in, because like uh, I just missed being with him, right? Yeah. Would somebody at this stage live thinking God is a member of our family? What leads you to, what, like, where does that come from? It comes from my own childhood because I've always felt that God was a member of mm. our family. Mm. When I described, I grew up in a monastery, but it was a noisy one. Yeah. <laughs> but God was a member of our family. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, he existed mm -hmm. every day yeah. in everything because of my parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just thought of that when mm -hmm. you were saying that. I mean, not that my family was perfect, but not, right, there not were, by any means. There were still, still some areas up here. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I think you don't even notice the distinction between our second level and the third level. Because mm -hmm. I can remember like when years and years ago, I wore a little book that was a liturgy of the hours, just a daytime prayer, mm -hmm. and mid morning, you know, afternoon, half to five noon. And I started doing the work. I remember I did it for a month. I remember saying to my sister, like, what are you doing this? This is too I'm getting nothing out of this. Yeah. So I forced myself to keep doing it. I did like for six months or yeah. like almost a year after. I had to go to a meeting one time where it was like it was face to face all day. I couldn't break away to do these little prayers. Mm -hmm. I missed it so much. Mm -hmm. It became such a part of my heart. Because I didn't even know that. But it's kinda like, you know, first part was just the first day, the second part was the duty. Yeah. Like I just kept doing it even though I felt I'm getting nothing out of this. But it's it's amazing how I transitioned to that third part where it became such a part of me. Yeah, you became a part of you. Yeah, became a part of the family. Um, let's kind of end with this. The uh, um, there's a story of um, a that goes back some time. It doesn't happen anymore. But that shepherds who would in the Middle East who would have a, a sheep who would be just unruly <laughs> um, and just go on wherever you know put itself in danger. Um, the shepherd would break one of its legs. <laughs> okay, which would force the sheep to I mean basically convalesce and heal but spend a lot of time with the shepherd right always around them. and and so um afterwards then the sheep never left the shepherd's side because it enjoyed just being with the shepherd yeah okay Tough life. what's that Tough life. that is if you go <laughs> um on this last stage here um a perfect this is um if you, Psalm 27, talks, captures this very well. Psalm 27, verse 4. Pull it up here. One thing I ask of the Lord, this I seek, to dwell in the Lord's house all the days of my life. To delight in the Lord's beauty. To dwell in the house of the Lord. One thing, one thing I seek. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I seek. Okay, this is David. To dwell in the house of the Lord. Um, taking delight, experiencing, experiencing joy, um, savoring his goodness. All right, glory be to the Father, to the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, so we'll meet again, not next, not on Holy Saturday, but the Saturday afterwards.
What, what? We'll just continue on. Okay. Uh, so that was 50. What was that? What did you just say? Um, we would not meet next week, but the week after. Right. And then we're, we'll continue on and we'll, we would be in, where was I pulling from there? Mostly 56 or? 57 is super short. Yeah, that wasn't it. Um, yeah, so 57. Started, yeah, 57 is just short. We'll talk about slavish fear. 57, 58, 59. Okay. 